one. And I think now we're in. So I, I don't even know what episode this is now. I think it's 30. But I'm very excited today because today I'm joined by Professor Mary Watson at the University of Delaware, the finest state on the eastern seaboard. Actually, I think it's Pennsylvania or New Jersey. But I don't know where you stand on the New Jersey versus PA versus Delaware battle well, we, because I know you're from the Florida. First suite, so <laughs> <laughs> it does say that it does say that on your license plate. Yeah, yeah, it's, which it's true. It's all true. <laughs> um, it's hard to match that. Um. I remember in middle school, there was like one of my like social studies teachers was really upset. It was like one of her like passions. It was like, you know, if Pennsylvania just like signed the declaration first or whatever the documentation was, I don't even really remember. He was like, we could have gotten that license plate. It's the first state. So it could have been us. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But you're not even from that area though. You're born in Massachusetts, and but grew up in Tampa Bay, which, by the way, I, I always have to say this because every time I hear people from Tampa Bay or they've been there, I love Tampa Bay, Florida. I went there last Memorial Day weekend with a few of my buddies. We stayed for like a long weekend, and man, I was blown away at like the activities that you can do. And um, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful town. It is so, a beautiful town. It's changed a lot. Um, you mm-hmm. know, they've revitalized the downtown area quite a bit. Um, so my parents uh, are still there. So when we go back to visit, I'm always shocked um, by mm. how much more there is to do downtown than there used to be. Um, but it was a pretty awesome place to grow up. Um, you know, there's some weirdness to it, right? Like we play soccer in the winter. I don't think any other state plays has winter soccer as their like <laughs> official season. Um but yeah, it, it's a beautiful place to grow up. I ran cross country and track. And so we used to run on Bayshore Boulevard, which is like miles right along the bay. And mm-hmm. I apologize if there's weird like breathing. My dog is here with me. Oh, bring her on. Is that, is that, a, uh, is that a Rottweiler? Uh, no, no, it's not. She, I couldn't she's tell. She's a Bernese Mountain dog. Her name's Pearly. Uh, That's a beautiful she, dog. She is um, a quite friendly little thing. Um, (laughs) so i apologize it's not me making the weird noises oh it's all good (laughs) it's totally her yeah no it's all good (laughs) actually the viewers would have been upset if you didn't show the dog so it's all (laughs) good yeah that's why i watch videos too Mm -hmm. my whole thing is dog videos Mm -hmm. (laughs) but uh yeah so like what what are like so obviously tampa bay like florida i mean obviously there's like the nightlife there but like when I went there, I didn't know the Salvador Dali Museum was there. And yeah. first of all, I don't know anything about, I don't really know much about art, but I was blown away at um, his art. Yeah. Um, so it's if those super who, cool, right? If, yeah. It was like, I was like, wow. So if people are ever in Tampa Bay, check out Salvador Dali Museum. Also, just like the greater area. So like, obviously like Clearwater, St. Petersburg. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a, just a great area. Yeah. We went into Ybor City, oh, which, was, which was... <laughs> I mean, obviously, like, like that is like the nightlife. That's where the nightlife yeah, happens. That um, is the nightlife. And uh, it was, I mean, you know, it's well. USF is there, or UT yeah. is there. Um, UT University and USF um, is closest to Ebor, and then mm-hmm. USF is more in North Tampa. Yeah, more, more, more yeah. north side. Um, but obviously, like, if you're in the well, it's really for anyone. But obviously, because like, it's a huge. It can be a huge college town, but also the medical school there for mm-hmm. Tampa is, is it Tampa? So, uh, so USF has the medical school. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So it's just, it's just, it's just a really fun town to be in if you're young. Um, I think, and obviously the, I don't know if you're a lightning fan, but when we went, uh, they were in the playoffs. So it was just, it was just, awesome. the energy was just great there. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you want to go, I would go for Gasparilla, the Gasparilla parade. So it's like mm-hmm. Tampa's version of Mardi Gras. I don't think it's quite <laughs> Mardi Gras status, uh, but it's pretty fun to see people dress up as pirates uh, and, mm-hmm. and storm the city. Um, and the other thing that you should do if you go is uh, eat a Cuban sandwich. A Cuban? Um, a proper Cuban. Okay. A proper Cuban sandwich made on real Cuban bread, um, mm. not the fake Cuban bread that you get everywhere else. So, yeah, it's awesome. Great. That's a great plug right there because I love me some Cuban sandwiches. Um, any other like secret spots people should, think you should know about? Um, well, the place my family always goes is Caladesi Island and Honeyman State Park. 
So that's kind of towards Clearwater. Um, but it's, it's absolutely Honeymoon State Park and Caledicia Island are just absolutely gorgeous beaches. Um, mm -hmm. And they're less um, crowded. Um, mm. And like in Honeymoon, you can also go for a hike and see armadillos and owls and bald eagles. Um, wear your bug spray, though, <laughs> if you go for yeah. a hike. Um, otherwise, stick to the beach. But you'll, you know, swim with dolphins if you go there. The natives, the natives are going to put you on blast because you're, you're giving away their spots right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's true. That's okay. I'm a native. I'm allowed to. Do yeah, that. yeah. You are. You are. You are allowed to say that. I will say that. I mean, we like when we were there. Also, to, like the manatees just came up mm -hmm. to us. I'm pretty sure we saw dolphins there too. Like we were pretty. Mm -hmm. I think we actually went there, Honeymoon State Park, because yeah. I think the locals were like, "Yeah, go there if you want to kind of get away from the the touristy yeah. people." I guess. And yep. dolphins were yeah, swimming right want, up to us. I was like, "Oh my like, god!" Yeah, if you want the beach scene, go to Clearwater Beach. But if you want mm -hmm. like a quiet beach day, um, seeing some wildlife, go to Honeymoon State Park. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, but you didn't stay in Tampa Bay forever, unfortunately. <laughs> you did. You did uh, go do your undergraduate at the at Harvard University, um, and you work for Professor uh, Dave Evans for undergraduate research who unfortunately passed away um, mm -hmm. in April, 2022. Um, but, you know, Dave Evans is probably one of the most influential chemists of the past half century. I mean, I mean, he's just that no notable. And some of his work is ACL oxidase, old and known methods. I mean, he's really honestly just like one of the pioneers in aldol chemistry, I think, at a, at a, you know, um, where creating uh, chiral enolates um, with oxazoldenones, and that chirality is transferred to get an aldol product, producing diastereoselective aldol reactions. And he also helped with developing diastereoselective diastere reductions of beta hydroxy ketones to create oh, anti dialcohols and 1 3 anti diol monoesters. So, mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask you is kind of like your experience with that, because I mean, um, mm -hmm. especially like, I mean, having like you know, being as young as you are at undergrad and then like, having like that kind of mentor, like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, you can even like put in the words, like what was some of your favorite experiences? What did you work on? And, and what was like some of the best advice he, he gave you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I think, yeah, sorry. It is hard to put into words. Um, you know, as you said, Dave Evans certainly um, has left an incredible legacy. Uh, as I think about it, having gotten, you know, been fortunate enough to spend some time in his group, you know, one of the things that stands out to me are the people that he worked with, um, that he trained. Um, and I'm not thinking about the undergrads uh, as incredible as some of the undergrads I got to work with were, um, you know, thinking about some of the grad students and postdocs who were in the lab at the time. Um, and, you know, they are now leaders in the pharmaceutical industry and in academia. Um, Tom Rovis was actually my mentor my senior mm. year. Um, and my project, uh, embarrassingly, I was working on an oxidation project where I essentially took every metal in the glove box and tested it, whether or not it would do this oxidation. So Tom mm. knew I wanted to do, you know, transition metal catalysis. Um, and he essentially, you know, figured out a project where I could practice some of those skills. Um, you know, and it's incredible that he did that actually, cause he was, you know, he was on the academic job market doing interviewing and all this other stuff. And, you know, the idea that he would take any time, uh, on a, a senior, uh, you know, undergraduate researcher at that point in his career, I think is, um, really speaks highly of Tom. Mm. Um, I did work on some boron enolate chemistry, um, you know, when I first started in the group and, uh, I have to admit, I struggled with it, mm. uh, you know, um, and, and one day I was at my fume hood and I had run, uh, you know, this reaction and I was determined I was going to purify my product. And so I was running, you know, one of these columns is like this big around. <laughs> and I, as an inexperienced researcher, I really um, did not load the column well. And, you know, of course, my reaction mixture was this brown nastiness. And mm. so the top of my column was like this and there were these brown streaks coming down. And um, there was an undergraduate, um, Albert, who was sharing my fume hood, and he was doing something that looked kind of equally um, inexperienced next to me. And maybe it was a Saturday or an evening. Um, 
And, you know, we kind of thought like we were being left alone to like make our mistakes and learn from them and laugh, right? You know, the, the grad students were kind of like, you keep working on that column. Yeah, but all right. of a sudden, you know, I feel this big hand on my back and I look over and there's Dave Evans and he's got one hand on my back, patting my back. And he's got another hand on Albert's back, patting his back. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's going to fire me. Like there's yeah. no way he sees this column and sees what I'm like doing and doesn't just fire me um because right he works with these grad students and postdocs who are absolutely cream of the crop like never screw things up at least that was my perspective mm -hmm. as an undergraduate um and so i was shocked when he says you're both doing great you're working so hard you're here on a saturday this is awesome i was just like <laughs> like it it blew my mind because my perspective of who he was and who he wanted me to be was so different from what his perspective was. His perspective mm -hmm. was that as an undergraduate, you should get in lab and work hard and learn. And, um, you know, I think he really was kind of a master educator and teacher. Um, and so he didn't care that I was screwing up a column, right? I was there, I was doing my best and, you know, I was gonna be better for it. And so I think maybe, you know, of things that I learned from Dave, I think that might be one of them is just mm -hmm. the, the value he put on people learning. And he did that in the classroom and in group meetings. I mean, he would always, you know, if a first year grad student was presenting or a second year grad student, he would always say for the benefit of the undergraduates in the room, can you go back and explain this concept that you're alluding to? Mm. And at first I would be so mortified, like, Oh my gosh, I'm, you know, this person's being put on the spot because I'm here. I'm the undergrad in the room. And then I realized, no, that's just his excuse to be sure that they can clearly explain a fundamental concept. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, he was, he was teaching me in that moment and having them teach me, but he was also being sure that they knew it and that they could teach it. Um, and so, you know, that was pretty incredible experience. Yeah, that's really cool. As um, yeah, it's, it's, it's this weird it's this weird moment because I've had a couple moments in my life too, where it's like, I'm like just a young impressionable student. And it's like, Oh my God. Wow. Like I'm talking to like, I'm talking to this, this famous person in my eyes and chemistry is yeah. kind of, it's kind of interesting like that in America too. Cause it's like, like, especially within the field of chemistry, we know who the big names are. And it's like, Oh my God, when you see them, you're like, Oh my God, that's him. But then like, I look at my friends they are like, who's this guy? Like, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> um, or something like that, you know? So it's just funny. Um, Absolutely. but yeah, I mean, that's really cool that you had the experience because, yeah. um, especially like, you know, that's a, I mean, he's a great educator. Like you said, I mean, I, obviously I never met him, but like, it seems like if people I've talked to and like my professors who have had a chance to, um, you know, speak with him and, uh, you know, they always say the same thing as well. So how did you like get into, well, first I, mean, I kind of want to take a step back for a second. Like, how did you like get into chemistry? Cause like, that's always a question I like to ask because um, it's a lot of people have different roads, how they get there. And then how'd you get into like working with Dave Evans lab? Like, how did you take that step? Cause I'm sure that was also not like, that's obviously a big step. Um, yeah. So I'll start with your question about how I got into chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think like many of us, um, I had an exceptional chemistry teacher in high school. Mm. Um, so, you know, Mrs. Blowers, um, you know what, I'm going to let my dog out into the back. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I'm sorry about that. So, oh, don't uh, worry Mrs. about it. Taught me AP chemistry, and uh, she was one of these teachers that had endless energy. And, you know, um, and she told us if you're going to take my class, you're going to work mm. and you're going to, like, you're going to pass your AP test. Um, and so, um, you know, I think like the last Friday of every month, there was a half day of school. And mm. so, if you were in this class, you were staying at the second half of that day to run experiments. She was like, there's no way we're doing chemistry without running experiments that take more than 45 minutes. Um, and so we would, you know, we would run these experiments and um, get to see how things worked. And some of them, you know, were cheesy, like making ice cream, um, but some of them were more meaningful. Um, and, uh, what, ice cream's not meaningful? Like... <laughs> <laughs> well, it is to me, but, uh, yeah. and, and the scientific concept at the high school level is actually, right? Like, um, yeah, yeah. You know, question and whatnot. 
Um, and she would take us on, you know, field trips. We went and spent a weekend at University of Florida mm. for some, you know, chemistry event. Um, and, you know, before the AP test, we would go over to her house and study. Like the whole class would like converge on her house and she would have snacks and we would just review the chemistry that we'd learned that year. And I think one of the things, you know, so see, you know, having a wonderful teacher uh, is, is certainly a big part of it. Um, I think the other part of it was, you know, that was um, when I started to realize that however hard I worked and however much I thought about it, chemistry would always go further than that. Mm -hmm. uh, there would never, like chemistry would never let me down, if that makes sense, right? Like there would always be the next question or the next puzzle or the next thing to figure out. Um, and that, uh, maybe sounds a little masochistic, but really appealed to me that that seemed like something I could spend my life doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I also really liked working with my hands. So when I took, um, chemistry as a college student, my favorite parts were doing the labs, uh, by far, um, in the early, you know, first and second year of, of, um, of college. Uh, and so I, I that also appealed to me that it wasn't just a you know, it wasn't just thinking mm -hmm. and sitting. It was also getting to um, make things and see that, you know, see them, um, you know, isolate materials, uh, you know, I don't know, the silly things, right? That like, you know, I didn't grow up in a house where my dad taught me how to use a screwdriver, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't learn righty tighty lefty loosey <laughs> until I was a college student. And I learned it because I was in the lab tightening, you know, hose clamps. Um, and doing things like that. And so um, I really enjoyed that. I thought that that was really fun. And I liked that there was this intellectual component and then there was this hands-on component. Mm. Um, and so um, actually one of my teaching assistants for one of my classes um, was a grad student in the Evans lab. And so I said, hey, I wanna you know, do research. Who should, you know, and he's like, great, go talk to Dave. <laughs> I didn't, and I, I didn't know, like, <laughs> I didn't know this was Dave Evans, right? Um, I think How fortunately, otherwise I wouldn't have gone and talked to him. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and then the big trick was not actually talking to Dave, it was getting past um, uh, his admin who protected his time. Um, you know, uh, I remember feeling very intimidated by her. <laughs> doing a good job then, I guess. She did a good job then, huh? <laughs> so she was far more intimidating to me than Dave Evans was. <laughs> Um, you know, which might be the stupidest thing I've ever done or ever thought. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, and Dave, Dave was just like, sure, you can, you can do research in my group. Of course. Um, I, I did do one summer of research at University of Florida before that. So, mm -hmm. um, after my freshman year, Ken Wagner, who's a polymer chemist at mm -hmm. University of Florida, um, very generously let me work in his lab. And, you know, when I started, he said, Mary, I will assume you can boil water and we will teach you everything else. Uh, and so That's good uh, philosophy. And, and they, they did. Um, so I had, I had had that experience before I asked um, Dave Evans mm -hmm. if I could work in his group. Yeah. I saw that. Uh, I saw that in your, uh, your, your bio, but I wasn't like, I'm not as familiar with, with Ken Wagner. So, you know, yeah, you, I found it, I'm more than happy to talk about like kind of your research there. I think that's pretty cool. I mostly followed around a senior grad student who was mm -hmm. very patient with me. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> really, I, all I could do was boil water. And he taught me, he really did like teach mm -hmm. me everything else. You know, I was making monomers um, yeah. for polymerization reactions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but, you know, Ken giving me a shot in lab and still then remaining as a mentor for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before I went to grad school, I made it a point to go to Gainesville and have lunch with Professor Wagner and talk with him. Oh, wow. about what I was thinking about doing. And, um, you know, when I, you know, tenure toward, I went back to Florida and, you know, there are incredible chemists at Florida and it's wonderful to see all of them, mm -hmm. but getting to talk to Ken again and tell him like, look, look how far I've come. I can do more than boil water. <laughs> uh, you know, that, um, I mean, seeing it, yeah, I was gonna say like seeing it come full circle. I mean, I, what else does a, a like an advisor want? Like, I don't know, like what else, to, like seeing their students like go on to do it, you know, it's a really special Absolutely. moment, I think. So, and that's why, Absolutely. that's, that's why they, you know, why professors are where they are now. And that's why you're kind of there now to kind of see your students one day come to full yep. circle, you know, that's really yeah. cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you're working, um, 
undergraduate. So I guess it was kind of a good segue then, because, you know, what was the, some of the decisions kind of leading into graduate school? I know like, um, and then like, um, and then how did you, um, end up at UC Irvine? Yeah. So, um, there's kind of two lines to that part of my story. So one of the things was that I did love chemistry. I do love chemistry. Um, and that I knew that, um, I might want to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so my senior year, I applied um, to a variety of schools. Um, and when I went on grad recruiting weekend, uh, and I went from Boston in February to Irvine in February, <laughs> and they took us to the beach, um, <laughs> I was like, oh, I could be happy here. Yeah. This could work out for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, and that's not, I obviously, um, I did not choose Irvine only for the weather. Um, you know, I also talked, you know, Keith Warple was there at the time, Larry mm. Oberman, uh, who I, who I worked with, um, when I was a grad student there. Um, but all the faculty who were there were super energetic and, um, just really excited about the research going on in their groups. And I, I was also really excited. That seemed like a place where great things were happening and mm. I wanted to be part of them. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, had spent a little time thinking about social justice in college. Mm. And so the summer before my senior year, I did a program where I worked at, as a counselor, um, at, a, um, a church in, um, inner city, Boston. Sure. Um, it's not inner city. It's a suburb. Uh, it just happens to be a lower income and predominantly black suburb. And so we call it inner city. Um, and if you're from Boston, you know, it's a church in Roxbury and, um, actually a church where Martin Luther King Jr. had interned as oh, wow. when he was a young minister. Yeah. So super amazing history within, um, the black community. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I had done that and thought a little bit about community building and what, um, whether or not I should have a role in, mm. you know, trying to make the world a, a more just place or what that role looked like. And so, um, you know, when, after I decided I wanted to go to Irvine, I asked Keith uh, Warple, who was the grad um, director at the time, if I could defer my start by a year. And I um, moved in uh, into Dorchester, which is neighboring Roxbury. Um, mm -hmm. And I became the AmeriCorps VISTA um, uh, fellow or volunteer or whatever, um, mm -hmm. which pays even less than a grad student stipend. Um, so, uh, and I worked at a community computer center where I taught people, um, computer skills. Um, and when I did it, I thought I was going to be like the cool person that like the teenagers wanted to hang out with. Um, <laughs> ironically, the people that related most to me and probably most appreciated my presence there were actually like the women that were 30 and 40 years old who mm. were, you know, they were trying to learn computer skills, even things like just like word processing so that they could go get a better job um, mm. and do better for themselves and for their families. And so um, it was a super rewarding experience. Um, and honestly, I wasn't sure that I was going to go to grad school at many points during that year. Mm. Uh, but one of my friends from undergrad came back uh, for a visit and he and I were talking actually about a Bob Grubbs paper. Um, I hadn't talked about chemistry with anyone for like five months. And, um, but I really, I really love um, alkene metathesis chemistry. And, mm. um, and we had this conversation and it reminded me that science provides an opportunity for people to connect um, in a pretty unique way. So even though I'd been teaching a lot of the work that I had been doing was convincing people that they could do the things they wanted to learn how to do on the computer. So it was mm -hmm. all about kind of how they, a lot of it was how they felt about it. Um, and I had reflected a lot about, you know, I'd been thinking, how do I feel about all this too? And so, you know, so much of my time is focused on how people felt. And in this conversation about the Scrubs paper, we didn't talk about how we felt about it. We talked about what was true mm -hmm. and it didn't matter that he was a second year grad student and I wasn't nothing in, in the chemistry world at the time. 
um, we could connect and we could argue and debate and dig into the facts and look for the data. Mm -hmm. Um, and it reminded me how much I enjoy those conversations. Um, and, and convinced me I wanted them in my life, right? I wanted that to be part of my career that I could connect with people and it didn't matter, you know, kind of people's stature within the field or any of that, that we could talk about science. Um, and I still, I should say, now that I am a professor, um, many of my conversations are about how people feel about things, right? I have mm. a second year is getting ready to go through their qualifying exams. Part of the discussion is how to get their talk right. But a lot of the discussion is you, like go in that room knowing you're the expert in the room. You have to feel that. You have to own it, right? And so, um, so I think you know, getting to be a scientist means I get to have the conversations that are about no one um, and not how anybody feels, and and where two people come together equally, um, regardless of kind of inequalities outside of that conversation. Um, and and but I also get to have the conversations about how people are doing. And, you know, excitingly, uh, you know, I think our field has really uh, started to embrace these ideas of social justice within mm. the chemistry community as well. And so um, I'm really excited about that, right? That this kind of, I think when I, you know, when I moved out of Dorchester to Irvine, which right, like moved to like one of the most expensive um, privileged community and whitest communities probably in our country, uh, you know, there was a question like, what am I doing? Am I kind of betraying mm -hmm. the, you know, the values that I think are really important. Um, and so it's really great now that I feel like our whole community is embracing those values and, mm -hmm. and saying, you know, how do we become a more just place, a more inclusive place where people, mm -hmm. um, can, can thrive and can bring their whole selves. They don't need, you know, they don't need to. Um, censor themselves uh, mm. in these spaces. Mm. I think that's, yeah, I think that's really, really admirable stuff. Um, I was going to ask, ask about this later, but perhaps this is a good time to, to kind of talk about it now and discuss this. Cause I think it, uh, it's obviously like, it's really, it's really important, but you are currently now a, one of the co-organizers of empowering women in organic chemistry um, conferences. So you're definitely, um, you're putting your, uh, words into action. You actually are trying to uh, do these things uh, for social injustices. Um, so, like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be quite frank with you. Like, you know, I'm a white cisgender male, so a lot of these issues, you know, I don't, I don't face in the day to day. Just, just that's just the, the that's just how it is. Um, so, a question I have is like, how, how, how bad is is the is the problem? Like, how bad is it? And then also too, like what can people like myself do to like, you know, help with social injustice within the field of chemistry? That's, you know, yeah, yeah. we can get a so, whole rabbit hole, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that question. I will also say, um, you know, I am also a white um, cisgendered heterosexual person. Mm -hmm. um, and so although, you know, women are a gender minority in chemistry, um, I benefit from exceptional privilege mm -hmm. and, um, my family and my background, uh, in terms of education is also highly privileged. My, both my parents are doctors. My grandfather, although he started out his life, um, you know, in a poorer family, he became a mathematics professor, right? Mm. So, um, you know, I think my, so I just want to put that on there that mm. I do not represent all minoritized people in chemistry, just for anybody listening. Um, and that, um, it's complicated. Um, and I also think, so, you know, when I think about, so, so to focus first on the gender dynamic, um, mm. and, and the numbers, um, you know, when I was a graduate student, I had an exceptional experience. I loved being a grad student in Larry Overman's lab. Um, in terms of kind of male female ratios in his group, right? He had about 25 grad students and postdocs at the time, and five of us were women, right? Which mm. actually isn't bad numbers um, at that time, certainly um, was not bad numbers. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, I didn't represent all women, right? So if you're the only of something in a room, sometimes you feel or you're expected to kind of be representative of 
all of that population, which is, mm. um, but it's kind of this like subconscious expectation that sometimes we apply to ourselves or to other people. Having five women meant that that wasn't true, right? Um, mm. So, um, but but as a grad student, and even as an undergrad, I was aware of um, female grad students and even male grad students who said, I don't want to go into academia because I want to have my weekends. I want to have a family. Um, and I feel like I won't be able to commit the way I want to to my family if I become a professor. And mm. I, I will explicitly say this was men and women who said this. Um, and so my assumption, uh, and, and I think, sorry, I will say that um, postulate, I think, is false. <laughs> um, I think you can you can commit to your family uh, and be a professor. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my assumption, because I heard people saying that, was that all the women were going into pharma and that pharmaceutical companies must be this panacea of, you know, um, gender equality, right? Like that, that, cause, cause that's where I saw my friends going. Right. Um, and, uh, the reality is, is that's not true. Um, so there've been some incredible articles that have come out, uh, over the last several years. So mm-hmm. there's one by Becky Rock and Margaret Fall. Um, actually they've now, um, they published it at, and then published an update to it, I believe. And they um, essentially were trying to quantify the number of women in process chemistry roles. Mm. Um, who, who's also, the author of this? I'm going to look it up later on today. Uh, yeah. So uh, Rebecca Ruck uh, and Margaret Fall, F-A-U-L. So Becky F-A-U-L. is at Merck, uh, Merck Process and Margaret is at Amgen. Um, and do you and happen then, to know like where it was published in? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link well, it to... I can link it to this site. I don't know. Maybe you can send it to me later on. I can too. send it to you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, actually, a little bit, I think a little bit before Margaret and Becky published that, um, Donna Hearn and some of her co authors published mm-hmm. a similar study looking at uh, how many women were in medicinal chemistry. Mm. And this is actually hard to do because uh, companies don't want to disclose <laughs> um, their numbers, right? And so, um, you know, you have to look at kind of how many women are there speaking at conferences and, and things like that. And so you have to extrapolate a little bit some of the numbers. And so um, the numbers are actually not, I, I, I can't remember the specific percentages, but, um, you know, they're not that much different than what I see in academia. Mm. And so I think then there's this question of where, where are the women going? Um, because at the graduate level, um, you know, at least at University of Delaware, our, gra- our incoming classes are 50-50 male, female. Wow. Um, okay. uh, and I, I, I don't know that that's common. Um, and I know at, at some programs, that's actually a challenge they face. They, they have trouble recruiting, you know, high percentages of female grad students. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, there, there certainly is this drop off that happens um, sometime between undergraduate and um, you know, becoming a, prof- a, a professional in chemistry. Um, and, you know, certainly there's many jobs that you can go into with, a, you know, training in chemistry. Uh, so it's not to say that academia, med chem and process are the only three options. Right. Um, but I think if we think about the tracks that men might be taking, um, they're going into those fields at a much higher rate. And so I think then the question is what's stopping, you know, what's the, what's the difference, right? Mm-hmm. Why, you know, why, why is there a difference there? Yeah. It's interesting though, because real quickly on that, I mean, generally speaking, women do better in school. Um, like, spe- like they do better in like, uh, what is it? Um, high school. And I, I don't have any data, but I, I assume that the same would apply at, like the, at least at undergraduate level where like women are just performing yeah. better yeah. within classes. So yeah. What is like, like what is stopping women right. from pursuing a higher, education, I guess, is that the right yeah. word or well, I think, higher degree? Um, I, not just a higher degree. Cause I think many women do, I think the numbers actually are quite a bit better for women, mm. the number percentage of women that are getting PhDs. Mm. I think then w- what careers are they going into or not uh, going into? Right? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the purpose of EWOC, uh, as we lovingly call it, um, is to, I, well, I guess one of the ideas is maybe part of the reason women don't pursue some of those careers is because they don't feel a sense of belonging. Mm. Uh, 
and they maybe lack a sense of the kind of the community that they need to support them into pursuing that. And so, you know, we, when we started, so Becky called me and said, Mary, do you want to help organize this thing? So that was 2018. And we were just going to have a conference at UPenn. We thought maybe 50 people would show up. <laughs> I thought most of them would be grad students, honestly, because uh, I'm biased towards, you know, academia and the experiences of our grad students. Sure. Um, and uh, we had to keep raising the registration cap until we finally kind of hit the limit of what this room could handle. And so we ended up, I forget the number, it was probably like a, a little bit over 200 folks who came. That's crazy. Um, it was awesome. And this um, is, is kind of this is kind of like out of the blue in some sense, right? You were just like, yeah, let's just do this conference and like, that's yeah, really cool. Yeah. So you, and, oh. and one of the things that was incredible was um, the participation from folks at, in pharma. Um, you know, so we had mm. a UPenn in the mid-Atlantic region, there's quite a few major pharma companies as yep. well as smaller companies. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it, that's when it became clear to me, like, oh, it's not just academia that is having this gender issue. Um, people are looking for this community, you know, kind of in all the chemistry careers. And, mm -hmm. and that um, was, it was really amazing to me to see that. And, you know, some people showed up because they just want to know other women um, who are doing chemistry build their networks. Some women showed up because they wanted to be a role model and, and a resource um, to other women who were there. Um, uh, men showed up. Jake Yeston, um, who is an editor at Science, um, you know, he came and he tweeted the whole time, right? Like, he was like, he, like live tweeted the event. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was really amazing. And, and, you know, and I will say Jake wasn't the only man who came mm -hmm. to that first conference. Um, there was actually a little row of them. So we were in a large lecture hall that probably sat 300 or 400 people. And all the men sat in these five seats in the front row or, you know, they kind of bunched together. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Why are they all sitting together? And then it struck me that most of the time when I go to a talk, all the women sit together and that seems totally normal um, because that's kind of, you know, like, that seems normal to me, but the idea that men would need to group up to feel safe did not seem normal to me. Mm. Um, and so th that really struck me that this was a different atmosphere um, just to just to change the kind of percentages of male, female in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm really glad, I should say, I am um, infinitely glad uh, that Jake and the other um, guys were there. I really don't think our field's going to change unless um, men show up to these conversations because, mm. um, yeah, it, it's just not going to change, right? Mm. Everybody in the room needs to realize that, um, needs to embrace this idea that folks should be made to feel welcome mm. and should be supported, um, mm. you know, and that everybody deserves to belong in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, certainly, um, you know, you want to, we want to bring in everyone, <laughs> we want to bring every, all cultures, uh, all, all, you know, all genders of, you know, however people identify, yep. um, as long as Absolutely. you can do, as long as you're interested in, in the science, like, uh, that's probably yeah. the only requisite really prerequisite yeah. is just being interested in the science. So what year was your yeah. first conference? So that was 2019. 2019, okay. Um, and so, um, so we're going to have our fifth year anniversary conference this summer. Awesome. Um, the so in 2020 and 2021, we moved to an all virtual conference, and we had over a thousand registrants mm -hmm. um, for that conference. And you know, I will say one of the amazing if people are thinking about going, um, you know, one of the amazing things about the conference is the energy the attendees bring. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried with other conferences I've helped with to replicate some of the same activities for networking and things like that. They're not the same. Mm. <laughs> and, it, and it's because people don't have the same expectation of coming together and supporting each other um, at, at kind of a typical chemistry conference. And, and I think right. that's a shame. I think all conferences should feel like EWOC. Um, and, I, and I will also say, right, EWOC's mission is to exist so that we don't have to eventually. Ah, we, okay. 
Mm-hmm. We actually would like to make ourselves or we would like the field to make us obsolete and unneeded mm-hmm. um, because people will feel like they belong and they're supported and they don't need a special conference um, to feel that. So, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to put it that, yeah, you exist now so that one day you don't have to. And it's really, yeah. that's, I think it's really, really sweet. And like um, one day at a time, hopefully, hopefully, I, I hopefully we get there. I yep, absolutely. Um, I, I, think the other- oh. I, I was going to say really quickly, like, I mean, I know people like, like in the Texas area that would be like, would love to go to this, this say, conference. So like, yeah. and hopefully, and hopefully by doing this, you know, we can, you know, spread the yeah. message about this. Um, so, for sure. So one of the really exciting things is that EWOC has, um, has uh, gotten a life of its own. So there are now regional chapters um, mm. that folks who attended the national meeting have started. And so there's actually one in Houston. Um, and so if folks are interested uh, in joining the one in Houston, send me an email um, and I will connect you with the organizers of the Houston chapter. Um, they go to brunch, <laughs> they they play chemistry bingo. They are super fun and awesome. And um, they definitely want folks to be involved. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I would, I would love to connect people. I think awesome. Aiden, I know you probably wanna talk about other stuff too, but I will just put out one more thing. Yeah. And it's really important in the chemistry community that we don't equate that, that we don't stop with gender equality. Mm. I think it's um, sometimes tempting because gender equality has been a concern for so long that we think like, oh, well, we invite, you know, we planned a symposium and we had, you know, women on as speakers. We're done. Right. Mm. I think there's a lot of other types of diversity that we need to um there's a lot of other people from my, you know, traditionally minoritized groups that that need to be in the room um, and need to be included and have a seat at the table. And mm. I, I think sometimes it's tempting, right? We check a box. Um, right. It's the it's a, it's, a, it's, we had it's a speaker lineup because there was a girl. Yeah, it's a lot of, and that's not. I'd say like a lot of the times it's like the virtue signaling. It's like, oh look, look what we did here. We're mm-hmm. so good, and then like back to the same old, I guess. Nothing really gets changed. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I mean, I do think things are changing and I mm-hmm. think people want things to change. I just think it needs to be a sustained effort. Right. And, um, and that's always the biggest problem. It's like, and then the other thing, it's like, how do you, but like, how do you sustain these things? Like, I, I, like, I don't even know like what, like, like I genuinely don't know. Yeah. So like, I think one of the things, so, you know, I'm on our departmental diversity, equity and inclusion committee. Mm-hmm. The reason that's still going is that my co-chair, um, Emil Hernandez Pagan, is just an exceptional person who's mm. deeply committed, um, deeply committed to you know kind of advancing our department and making it better. And um, so I think having a partner or a series of partners, you know, the Ewok Organizing Committee. Um, it's unlike other any other committee I've ever served on. You know, most committees, nobody wants, like everybody's like taking a step back. Yeah, but right. You walk, everybody is, um, you know, leaning in and asking how we can help each other. If somebody, you know, um, is having trouble getting something done, somebody else steps up and asks how they can help. And mm. it's really, um, yeah, having partners who are going to, keep you going when you don't, when you're not in that same place and then you can do it back for them um, mm. when they need it, I think is really important. I think one person doing this alone is, is not sustainable probably. It sounds impossible. It sounds exhausting yeah, too. Sounds impossible. <laughs> but it's, if you know, I mean, when I work with Emil or when I work with Donna and Becky, you know, I feel like I've gotten so much out of mm. helping to organize Ewok. Um, and I grow so much when I talk to Emil that it makes me want to keep doing that, even though there's work, right. Even though, um, you know, there's, there's never enough time in, in the day. Um, so yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's how it's been sustainable for me. Mm -hmm. It's also like the power of like word of mouth and social media and spreading the word. I think, um, a big issue in America is just so freaking big. It's like, how do you like. It's, it's just so big. It's like he, we had to like spread this message. And so, um, 
keep plugging away at it. I, I'm, I'm excited to see if there's an Ewok here in Houston. I'm going to definitely uh, at least check it out for sure. And then uh, I'm going to get get some of my uh, my uh, my women who I work with and see if they're interested in that. And then hopefully uh, yeah. keep it going. But the, the, the conversation of social injustice, I mean, obviously in general, is never ending. But at least in chemistry, at least we can have a, we at least have a role to play in that for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm certainly here. And it's kind of this part why I have guests on like yourself to kind of speak about these issues because um, I don't. It's like I don't really know how big of a problem they are, or, um, and so I just look to help assist with that and say, okay, what can we do to fix this thing? So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk about it. Yeah. And that, I'm excited. I'm excited to, I'm excited to, to kind of work with it down and spread this message. So let's, let's do it. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, but so, but then going back to, so now you're a graduate student at, with, uh, Larry Overman. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, so first of all, like your experience at UC, UC Irvine, like, uh, that wasn't chemistry, um, beautiful. I'm sure it's a beautiful city, but I've actually never been out to California. So like, I don't know, do, do the words do it justice of like just the environment? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, it is, it is definitely beautiful, you know, honestly, um, well, right now, obviously they have just had this big snowstorm and all this crazy rain. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was there, actually, there was a running tally in the paper of how many days it had been without rain. Oh boy. And it was hundreds, right? Hundreds of days without rain. And so we would joke how, you know, how the weather was boring, which in retrospect, of course, paradise is boring, right? <laughs> like, that's like how it is. Um, you know, I would say kind of like, having fun in Irvine, you know, Irvine is a, it's a planned community. Um, Mm. and so, um, you know, I think probably if you want to go have fun in, in that area, um, you know, some of the towns surrounding Irvine, um, might be, uh, you know, Laguna beach is like, I mean, when I was prepping for my quals, that's where I went every Sunday. I'd go and sit in a coffee shop for hours, and then I would go sit on the boardwalk and just put my feet in the sand for a while to, like, you know, so dial nice. it back down. Right? Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty sweet <laughs> sweet deal. So, um, you know, it's the kind of place where, as a grad student, you know, people would joke, like, oh, I couldn't possibly go to grad school in some place so nice because I would never want to be like it would be too hard to stay inside in lab. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is, as a grad student, if you only have an hour outside a day, um, kind of when it's light out, um, sorry, hopefully that doesn't sound too crazy, but um, you want it to be a nice hour, right? right? And so like in Irvine, it's always nice, right? Um, so, and you know, I, I ran a lot at that time and there were great running and biking trails. And, mm you know, going to the beach or going for a hike, right? You could, um, you know, go for a hike in the desert. Um, super cool place to go hiking. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really awesome. I also feel like people... Don't tell Larry I did any of that, though. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Your secret, your secret is safe. Um, <laughs> I also, I, I also kind of low-key feel like people overplay that excuse where it's like, because I've even said it myself where it's like, yeah, if I like went there, I would never get any work done. But it's like, like... I, I, I got accepted to go into like to where did I uh, Florida Tech for graduate school, and yeah. I was like, oh man, Melbourne, Florida. Would I get any work done there? I'd be on the beach all the time. But like honestly, looking back, like if if hypothetically I went there, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Like there's the work to be done in the in the. I don't think yeah. you. I don't think people are as distracted as easily as people might think they are. So yeah. I could definitely yeah, attest no, to that. Right. And and right, if you're going to grad school, you love the chemistry. Right. Yeah. So. Whether or not it's cool to say we love being in lab, at some level we love being in lab. So you're gonna do that too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, so how was it? Like, how did you decide to work for like Larry Overman? And what did you work on as a graduate student? Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I worked on the palladium catalyzed allylic imidate rearrangement. Mm. Um, you might want to explain that. Overman rearrangement. Okay. <laughs> so um, so this rearrangement. Um, is formally, a th- and it can be done thermally. So if you do it thermally, it's a three, three sigma tropic rearrangement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a way of converting an allylic alcohol precursor, which is easy to make into an enantio enriched allylic amine product. 
And the way that um, Larry's group figured out how to do this was if you use a chiral palladium catalyst, you can change the mechanism um, so that it goes through like an Azovacher uh, type uh, intermediate. And so in that step, then the chiral palladium catalyst could control which phase of the alkene is attacked by uh, the, the, the tethered amine mm. um, or imidate. And so that allows you to have um, usually some pretty remarkable levels um, of enantioselectivity in the process. And so um, I, the catalyst for it, um, you know, when I joined the group, we were using um, chiral catalysts that had ferrocene rings in them. So some pretty um, interesting chiral catalysts. Um, and we were using ones that had cobalt sandwich complexes. Mm -hmm. So they had chirality and then they also, um, you know, had this planar chirality issue. Um, and, uh, I was just super intrigued, um, by these beautiful palladium catalysts. Um, I really loved that chemistry. I also love the heck reaction. And so, you know, Larry's <laughs> program doing asymmetric synthesis, asymmetric total synthesis using the heck reaction, um, was very appealing to me. Actually, my first project in the group was trying, uh, to, um, isolate, um, some, uh, palladium intermediates mm -hmm. and kind of see how generally we could do that. Um, I didn't get it to work. So if you're a first year and you're struggling with your first project, join the club. Um, <laughs> it's like the story of every graduate student ever. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but it was like the idea of it, I just thought was so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it, uh, um, I had a lot of fun, you know, I got really interested cause I was so, you know, I was, I was very interested in kind of the organometallic aspects of it. Mm -hmm. I got very interested in doing mechanistic studies. So, um, Tom driver was in the Whirlpool group. So we were on the fourth floor and the Whirlpool group was on the fifth floor. And so I would go talk to Tom and he like discipled me that mechanistic study was the thing I needed to do. Right. This was mm -hmm. like, this is going to be, you know, my, a big contribution and how cool it was. And I, I just ate it up. Like I thought it was like the coolest thing in the world. And so, um, so Larry actually, uh, he made me write a proposal and all of that, but he agreed I could um, study the mechanism of the eliminate reaction, um, which I ended up doing actually um, at UC Berkeley in collaboration with Bob Bergman. Um, and so my last two years of grad school, I spent in Berkeley um, and that coincided with my personal life really well. Um, so I met my husband, my you know, at that time, um, well, he wasn't my husband at that time, obviously. Um, I, met him, <laughs> yeah. I met him in Larry's lab, but he was a year, few years ahead of me. And so he did a postdoc in the Bergman lab. Um, and I was able to do my mechanistic studies in the Bergman lab at the same time, um, which is incredibly generous of Larry uh, and yeah. Bob. And I, I still can't believe they let me do it. So um, it was super awesome. That's a really cool experience. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really cool. The, uh, the Overman rearrangement that was like you contributed to that. It's really cool. Um, yeah. So, oh man. So then how, so going from, going from graduate school and then doing your postdoc at, uh, oh my God, wait, I know it. Uh, with Eric Jacobson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, oh my yeah. God. How could I forget that? Um, <laughs> what were like some of the, like the steps to like go, like, was it a natural progression to go do a postdoc? Like how, how was that experience? Yeah. So I, um, so like I said, my husband was a few years ahead of me and he was doing his postdoc with Bob Bergman. Um, so Don Watson, in case folks know him, um, who's my colleague. Shout out. Now. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, as he was wrapping up his postdoc, we kind of had to decide, um, was he going to go on the, acad so he also is a professor and wanted to be a professor at the time was he going to go get a job and I was going to try to get a postdoc where he got a job and then try to transition into a faculty position mm. two years later, somewhere in the same area. Um, or was he going to do a second postdoc and then we go on the academic market for permanent positions at the same time. And, and I was not, you know, I guess the third option is that I would have tried to do it without a postdoc, but I was not ready to do that. Um, and, you know, so uh, Don decided, Don's really great at setting um, priorities and then living by them. <laughs> so uh, he said, you know, I think that our best chance of getting two academic positions in the same place, which is our was our priority, um, would be for him to do a second postdoc. And so 
Um, he postdoc with Steve Buckwald um, when I postdoc uh, with Eric Jacobson. So, you know, part of the calculus was we wanted to be in the same place. Um, and then, you know, for me, I had actually taken organometallics with Eric when I was an undergraduate. Wow. And he's full circle again. a genius. <laughs> yeah, full circle again. Uh, you know, he's a genius. And the way he talks about science and mechanism, right, which I was super into and thinks about reaction coordinate diagrams and kinetics. I mean, obviously, right, he's built his whole career on being able to control the kinetics in these enantioselective reactions and get high enantioselectivity. Um, you know, that just seemed kind of like a perfect fit. Mm. And it was, it was um, a fantastic fit. Um, you know, when I was there, um, my first project, so I got there kind of in the transition as people were moving from like cobalt saline chemistry mm -hmm. and then moving more and more towards thiourea um, organocatalysis. Okay. And so my first project was actually working on, you know, metal saline chemistry. Uh, and yet again, my first project didn't go very well. And so um, Eric was amazing. And he said, well, Mary, you want to be a professor, right? I said, yes, I'd like to do that. He said, well, your whole job is going to be coming up with ideas. So go practice. And I said, Eric, what if my idea isn't thiourea catalysis? <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> like, is that okay? And he said, Mary, run it by me before you work on it. Um, but essentially, as long as it's not illegal, go do what you want to do. <laughs> Which, um, again, was one of those moments where, especially now that I'm a professor, is amazing, right? That, um, you know, that Eric supported me in that way and gave me that freedom. Um, and, and so I actually worked on a nickel catalyzed reaction. I was the only person in the group um, working on a nickel catal catalyzed reaction and Eric let me run with it. Um, and he absolutely helped me problem solve with it. Um, you know, it wouldn't have gotten to the same place without Eric and so, and without the other people in the lab. Mm -hmm. And so that was um, just a really amazing experience yeah. to, get to do that. And, you know, of course now I am still working on nickel catalysis and so um, getting to do that as a postdoc was a really important step for me um, to moving into kind of what my independent program um, has become. Yeah, I was going to say, because uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, I was just going to say, it sounds like what you worked on as a postdoc is kind of what you're, there's that natural progression to what you're doing now. So yeah, that's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I talked to professors, obviously I talked to professors a lot, but the idea of doing a postdoc just sounds more and more appealing. At first I, I was like, um, I was like, ah, postdoc, or, uh, kind of want to go do a uh, like industry, but honestly, the, like all I ever hear about is like, just, you can, in some ways you can kind of live where, I mean, you can kind of live wherever you want and in some sense, do whatever you want. If you have a nice soup, like, I mean, it's like, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of oversimplifying it a little bit, but that's what it seems no, like. No, but anyway. it's true, right? It's a two year commitment and you know, you're going to probably move on after that two years. And I think if you're at a point in your life where, you know, that's something you can do. There's a lot of freedom in that. Mm -hmm. And I, I will also say I loved being a postdoc. Um, you know, I also have, you know, students that I work with who are like, no, I'd like to get a job. I want to get on with my life. But it's awesome to be a postdoc. You know, somebody else is in charge of paying the bills. <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, I wrote for a, a, a postdoc fellowship and got one, right? So I suppose I took some hand in paying the bills. But really ultimately somebody else is taking the ultimate responsibility there. Yeah. And um, you have a ton of, you have a ton of capability. Um, so it's really different than starting as a grad student where you're, you know, hopefully when you do a postdoc, you still have a really steep learning curve. Um, but at the same time, you know so much. So the place you start on that learning curve is just a totally different place. Um, and, you know, I, Eric's group was about half postdocs, half grad students, and they were all brilliant. <laughs> and so um, that's also just an amazing community to be part of mm. um, and to talk about chemistry with and see what people are excited about and how they think about it, um, what they think the next, you know, what's coming next and what are they, you know, it, it, just amazing uh, and inspiring to be around people like that. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a fantastic experience. There's also like I, no I pressure. Learn. There's also like no pressure of like qualifying exams or like dissertations and right. stuff like that. It's like you so literally just do the science. Yeah. 
So, so that's, that's absolutely true. I would say the one caveat to that is because, so if you're planning to postdoc for two years, you're probably going on the job market a year after you start. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to talk about something from your postdoc as, as you know, even if you talk about your grad research, which I did, um, many people do, you're still going to have to talk about something from your postdoc. Right. So there is, there's absolutely, um, some pressure, um, and motivation mm. to get something, a story, right? You want to have a story, um, that you can tell, but that said, I spent three years in my postdoc. So if you don't have a story, a great story after year one, you know, that's a conversation you can have with your mentor. Um, you know, is that the right time to go out or not? And Eric and I had that conversation. It was, um, really helpful for me, um, to know that I could um, build up my story, um, and grow a little bit more mm-hmm. over the next year. Um, and then really be ready when I went on the job market. Yeah. So yeah. how was how it finding that, uh, position at Udo? Did you go right there or? Yep, yeah. I did. So, um, so Don and I had lined everything up, mm-hmm. um, and it was a really exciting, uh, you know, there were all these job ads coming out, um, and we were like, this is amazing. Like we've never seen so many job ads coming out. Um, but it was the fall of 2008, which is when um, the global economy crashed. <laughs> oh, and boy. so there were all these ads in August. And then, you know, by mid-October, we were getting letters from places we had applied to saying we've closed our search, like, because of the economy, essentially. Mm. Um, and we were thinking, like, wow, if we're getting letters from some people, think how many more people just aren't sending a letter. Um and so that was, um, you know, we had kind of done everything to be six, like we'd done a second postdoc for goodness sake, right? Like all this stuff to kind of think that we had our personal timing perfect. And then the world just decided. That the world said, no, not, not today, not today. <laughs> yeah. um, but nonetheless, UD search, um, they, you know, they kept it open they kept searching. And, and in fact, I think they were really smart. They said, if other schools aren't, aren't going to be searching. We have opportunities to recruit um, mm. great talent. And so um, they had a single opening. So technically my husband and I competed for it. Um, but then when they recognized that they wanted to make us an offer, they again were very smart and said, if you're going to hire half of a couple, they're not going to stay. So why invest the money in the first place? Let's hire them both. And um wow. And, and, and then they're much, much more likely to stay. And so they created a second line and brought us in. And, um, yeah, we've, we've been there ever since. That's really so that cool. was 2000, well, 2009 that we started. That's yeah, really cool. it was amazing. I, you know, my colleagues at UD, um, you know, Joe Fox ran that search. Um, Klaus Theopold um, was chair of the department. You know, they made it happen and they hustled and they, um, you know, it is pretty incredible mm-hmm. uh, that it worked out. UD is a very good school. I have uh, a lot of my, cause I went to Widener University. I don't know if you know where that is. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's right in my undergrad. A lot of my awesome. professors at the time and they did, they, they were in the integrated division, but they did their, um, their, uh, graduate degree in, at UDL. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. UDL is a that's very awesome. good school. Um, yeah. The chemistry there is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. I interact well. with Andy Martin. You must have taken classes with Andy Martin. Andy Martin. Right? Yep. My, uh, yeah. yep, my inorganic professor and the head of the department. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So she's um, very active still in the, the Delaware ACS. And so I interact with her some through that. So, she, yeah. it was actually also on my podcast like years ago at this point, because I started this podcast when I was like an undergrad. So she's, uh, she was on here a while ago. I gotta actually, I gotta go back and see how she's doing. Honestly, her, I gotta see the whole department. I haven't been back in a while. I gotta go see them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really cool. They would love it. Another first circle. There it is. Another full circle right there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so now uh, let's get into what you work on now because this is this is really exciting stuff. Actually, side note on what you work on now. Um, one of my group members just had their second year like presentation talk and it was on like, de- like generally, broadly speaking, it was on deamination. And we, we like, she like highlighted your work on, uh, um, you know, taking a means as basically mm-hmm. turning a means into electrophiles and then doing chemistry with that. So um, mm-hmm. I'm going to kind of let you take the floor here a little bit to explain your research, but generally speaking, um, I know you work on uh, like using amines and alcohols and turning them into electrophiles so that you can do chemistry with them is 
-hmm. And then I also know that you do like an anti-selective copper catalysis. So yeah, yeah, I'm going to kind of let you take the floor here because I think it's really cool. Um, And then we'll kind of dive into it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So um, our research program is really, well, it's focused on essentially in the broadest terms, using transition metals um, as catalysts to make organic molecules do things they would never otherwise do. Um, And uh, a lot of our program is really focused, as you said, on identifying starting materials that are either easy to make um, or widely abundant um, and uh, coming up with ways to use them in transition metal catalysis to be able to make new things, um, hopefully that are useful to someone. (laughs) (laughs) But we'll say sometimes we're closer to that mark than other times. Mm. Um, And so, you know, when we started, um, you know, when I started my group, I thought everything we would do would be an anti-selective catalysis. Um, and so we do have our um, copper catalyst program where, as you said, we use chiral copper catalysts. And we do an anti-selective alkylations of cationic intermediates like oxocarbenium and aminium ions. Um, and, you know, those are nice targets because uh, we typically use cyclic oxocarbeniums and aminiums. And so we're making um, alpha chiral saturated heterocycles mm-hmm. um, that are uh, useful, um, hopefully, uh, to folks in <laughs> synthesis and, and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and then, um, but a lot of our program actually kind of pivoted um, and we recognized that we could, instead of doing an anti-selective catalysis, um, we could do stereospecific chemistry. And this was really inspired um, by work from Liz Jarvo's lab. So she's at UC Irvine. Mm. Um, we didn't really overlap, unfortunately, um, but uh, she um, has built an amazing program of doing stereospecific cross couplings using um, benzylic, highly enantiomer-enriched benzylic alcohol derivatives, mm-hmm. um, and transforming those into products that otherwise um, would be very difficult to make in high EE. And so um, we realized that we could make some contributions in that area. Um, we really like to use. Um, uh, bronic acid or bronic ester coupling partners um, because they're so convenient and functional group tolerant. So some of our contributions have been figuring out how to get that chemistry to work. Um, and then one of the things in the stereospecific chemistry we've done uh, a little bit more recently is we've gotten really into the idea of making all carbon quaternary stereo centers mm. in high EE. And so, um, and I really like these examples. Uh, Quick question about uh, that, though. So what's the difference between, like, stereospecific and, like, let's say, an anti-selective versus, like, diastereoselective? Like, what, like... uh, Yeah, great question. So, um, okay, so I guess I usually think about an anti-selective catalysis versus stereospecific catalysis. Mm -hmm. So an anti-selective catalysis, you're going to use a chiral ligand um, and go through um, a racemic or readily, you know, use a racemic, uh, sorry, an achiral starting material um, or go through, you know, a a epimerizing intermediate, right? Stereoconvergent Mm -hmm. uh, pathway. Um, And so in that case, the chirality of the catalyst is what induces the chirality of your product and controls it. In a stereospecific cross-coupling, we can use a simple achiral nickel catalyst um, and it's, and we use a highly enantioenriched starting material. Mm. And so, uh, and then we maintain that high enantioenrichment as our starting material is transformed into our product. And so it meet, so if a reaction is stereospecific, it means that the mechanism needs to essentially hold on to that stereochemistry. So, you know, an SN2 reaction is maybe, um, you know, the best well-known stereospecific transformation. It always goes with inversion of configuration mm-hmm. um, because mechanistically it has to. I suppose formally the definition of a stereospecific reaction is one where the stereochemistry of the product dictates the stereo, sorry, stereochemistry of the starting material dictates stereochemistry of product. Okay. Um, and so for a stereospecific reaction, I think to be really useful you have to identify starting material that you can make in high EE. And so for us, we've used alcohol derivatives and we've used amine derivatives. Mm -hmm. Um, We actually really like the amine derivatives because Elman's auxiliary chemistry means we can make all of them in perfect EE every time. Yeah. Um, And so, um, and you know, there's, 
I don't know. I think sometimes organic chemists argue about funny or debate funny things. <laughs> I think one of the one of the questions is, um, won't an anti-selective catalysis always be better than a stereospecific approach? Right. Um, so wouldn't it always be better to start with a racemic starting material and make a highly enantioenriched one or an achiral starting material and make a highly enantioenriched one? I can hear a lot and of I professors think, having that debate right now in my, in my head. Yeah, right. Oh, really? Okay. So I, so I think it's an interesting question, but I think it's actually a little myopic because mm. um, the question, you know, of course, if you could do the same transformation and anti selectively, then you should do that. But the reality is, is that the, the, a lot of the things we're doing stereo specifically, like making these all carbon quaternary stereo centers, they have a methyl and an ethyl substituent on them. It would be very difficult to find a chiral catalyst that could differentiate that mm. um, in the transition state. In contrast, we can make that highly enantio enriched alcohol really easily by an enantio selective catalytic re addition to a ketone. That's easy. And then essentially what we do is add value to that transformation by saying the product of that enantio selective reaction can be used in the stereospecific transformation to get a product you otherwise oh, can't get. There. That's really cool. So I think the real value, right, is, well, to recognize that we need multiple approaches and that sometimes the second approach complements the first approach, right? Mm. Um, usually we're not doing one react. I mean, when we optimize and we're trying to publish in JAX, we're doing one reaction. But usually if we're actually trying to build something, we're not doing one reaction, right? We're doing this series of reactions. And so having ones that work together well like that you know, so I guess I would say we don't need to debate which one is better. We need to recognize that stereo specific reactions complement what we can do in anti selectively. That's really cool. Um, uh, philosophy, yeah. I think. So, I, obviously, I've thought about that too much. <laughs> well, it is your area of research. You, sh you should be ready to combat these professors that say, oh, no, yeah. anti selective reactions. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. what so. I guess, I guess a question that would be pretty beneficial is the idea of turning amines and alcohols into electrophiles. Um, is, is so, pretty important because for people that like don't know chemistry, um, I mean, traditionally speaking, it's, it can be hard to, not the alcohols and the means are not good functional handles cause they are, but them as electrophiles, traditionally speaking, can be pretty difficult. So, um, yeah, the idea of, yeah, I don't, so, I don't know if you would kind of want to enlighten us on that a little bit. Yeah. So, anyone wants to that. So, so with our, our chemistry, you know, breaking carbon oxygen and carbon nitrogen bonds, um, you know, we started out thinking about stereochemistry. We activated our alcohols as carboxylates and we activated our amines as ammonium salts. Mm. Um, but it turns out that if we use those activation modes, they're really um, best if we're doing um, benzylic or allylic CO or CN bonds. And so this question of how do you move from needing that electronic benefit of your substrate of your alkyl group being benzylic or allylic to not needing that. And so um, one of my graduate, former grad students, Corey Bosch, um, realized that we could do that if we converted the amine into a Katritsky pyridinium salt. And so um, Alan Katritsky from University of Florida had shown uh, that you can take a primary amine and you can condense it. Uh, with a perillium to uh, create a 246 triphenyl pyridinium salt. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I will admit, when we first did that chemistry, we were hoping it would be stereo specific, that it would allow us to do stereo specific transformations beyond benzylic um, electrophiles. Um, it's not stereo specific because, of course, the reason we can do benzylic, get beyond benzylic electrophiles is that we change the mechanism. And um, these pyridinium groups are not just good leaving groups, but they're also um, excellent uh, antennas to accept an electron from transition metal mm. catalysts. And so we switch from doing two electron nickel chemistry to doing um, one electron nickel chemistry and going to, you know, a nickel one, three catalytic cycle instead of a nickel zero two catalytic cycle, which our stereo specific chemistry had gone through. Mm. And so um, we have had a ton of fun with that. Because uh, it turns out that's probably the thing that my group's done um, that's most useful to folks in med chem. Um, it's not useful to folks in process chem. <laughs> they, uh, the leaving group is too enormous. Uh, they don't want to do it. Um, but in, in med chem, um, because there's so many alkylamines that are available, 
um, I think in large part because they've been using them to make amids mm. uh, in, med, in you know medchem campaigns. Um, essentially, what we're doing is allowing them um, to replace um, that chemistry, use the same starting materials, but now make alkyl arenes. Um, so we can do cross couplings with things beyond aryl groups, but. Um, pharma does definitely seem very interested in SP3, SP2 carbon, carbon, uh, bond connections. And so, um, that's the one where we really, um, had some fun collaborations with folks at Pfizer and folks, um, at Merck. And so we've learned a lot by doing that because now we get to kind of peer behind the curtain of what might be useful, um, in a method we develop for somebody to actually use it. Yeah. It's really um, cool. At a company. Yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. What are, what are like, so like, what are like the drawbacks of, well, what do they say are the drawbacks to like your chemistry? If, if you were to go like pharmaceutical scale, like what, like, uh, like process scale. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think the reality is, is where the pyridinium we're using has three phenyl groups on it mm -hmm. and it's just enormous. And so the byproduct of all our reactions is actually fairly high molecular weight. Mm. If you think about running that in one of their like big kettles, right. And you have to like open a valve at the bottom and train out your product. It just, um, I think is a little too, it's just a lot of mass, right. I see. Um, okay. and, mm. um, and, and also, yeah. So, um, I think that's probably one of the bigger things. We're actually working on kind of designer pyridiniums that may uh, answer some I of those that. questions, but they're not ready. Mm. They're not prime time ready yet. Um, that's the exciting so, part of uh, yeah. you know, academic academic research is like these are the you know I've actually I was talking to, I had a like I guess a philosophical um, chat with one of my lab mates who's kind of a senior member now. We were talking about the role of academia in like let's say pharmaceutical chemistry and he was kind of enlightening me where it's like you know like we can we can like have these reactions that let's say may never go pharmaceutical scale but you have to remember it's not like per se our job like like yeah, yeah. it's like we're just we're interested in the chemistry like um whether or not you can make this pharmaceutical scale is is you know not our prerogative in some sense um right. and so you kind of have to remember that now that's not to say that we shouldn't try to do that um yeah yeah so i think you know, one of the things that I've learned a lot by getting to interact with folks at companies um, is, you know, chemistry can be super useful for medicinal chemistry discovery, mm -hmm. for discovering um, lead compounds. Um, and that can be totally different chemistry than what's useful at the process scale. And so our chemistry is being used um, by medicinal chemists at, at companies. Um, you know, because for them, the priority is, you know, speed of making molecules, right? So the faster they can make a molecule or a diverse set of molecules, the faster they can test them. And so, you know, our chemist, our chemistry works, right? You can condense and make the pyridinium. You can do the cross coupling. Um, you can do it in, you know, parallel um, formats, um, at least for some of our cross couplings. Um, so, you know, I think it, uh, opens up opportunities for them to, you know, do both early stage, but also late stage functionalization yeah. um, using, using the amine handle. Um, so, you know, I think that the, I don't know, I'm okay with process chemists not using our chemistry. Yeah. Somebody's using our chemist, right? The, the med chem um, folks um, actually really, really value it. Right. right? And so um, I think often in academia, when we talk about, you know, optimizing it, especially a catalytic reaction. Um, you know, I think often we're kind of focused on the process chemistry perspective, which is a very important perspective and sometimes the most appropriate one to take. But I think there's a lot of catalysis that's useful at the medicinal chemistry uh, um, stage. Mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, that's also really important. I mean, you know, some of our cross couplings, the yields aren't so great. Yeah. Um, but we're actually doing complex substrates and showing folks, you know, what heterocycles are tolerated. Um, you know, one of our first collaborations, they were like, oh, can you, you know, our collaborators said, can you do this heterocycle? And we were like, yeah, we can, but the NMR yield is only like 21%. And they were like, that's amazing for that heterocycle. <laughs> like you have to put it in paper, right? Because people will use it, right? It's like, oh, that's way better than what we do with other methods, right? And so... Um, but from the academic perspective, trying to get a paper published, I was like, we can't put that in the paper, right? Like, so, you know, we compromise, we put it in the SI, right? So, um, you know, I think that that's, there's a tension there, right? I mean, if, 
for a med chem, sometimes all you care about is getting the material. Right. You don't care about your, right. And so, you know, in that case, as long as you can purify your material a 20% yield, may be just fine. Um, and I don't know how to deal with that. Cause I also think about, well, if you're optimizing a reaction and you stop at 20% yield, I don't really think the paper should be published. Right. Right? Like, mm. like, you know, that is not efficient catalysis. So what do you, you know, how, how do we deal with that? How do we get people the information they need to use the chemistry, but also then, you know, hold ourselves to a high standard mm. um, as folks that optimize reactions. Yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. I don't know if you've, if everyone's like ever asked you like about this issue, but I, I was just kind of curious because you do nickel catalysis. Do people like, uh -huh. do people kind of have pushback on like the toxicity of nickel at all, but it is a 3d metal, but like also like, um, like where it's mined and stuff like that. Do you ever like hear about that at all or? Um, no, okay. honestly, okay. I think, you know, I, I think that, well, maybe people are saying it. Usually they're not saying it to me though. Um, I think that the, I feel like our field being able to take, you know, move from palladium to nickel. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people are like, oh, that's enough. I mean, it's kind of like we were talking about like, oh, having women in the room, like, oh, that's enough, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the reality is no, that's not enough in terms of long-term sustainability, right? Um, right? Uh, we need to get to more sustainable metals. Mm -hmm. um, but again, at the medicinal chemistry scale, with the goal being speed, um, and they're not running on large scale reactions. Mm -hmm. um, they're not asking those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. um, we do have goals um, to look at more sustainable metals. I think that would be really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but no, people don't. Okay. Most of yeah. the people who need pushback, um, the pushback is do you really need all three phenyl groups? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that's the that's their problem actually right? i i guess a question about that then is like for like a mechanistic standpoint because I'm, I'm gonna ask from the chemistry point of view like why do you need this those phenyl groups there yeah yeah so um so we collaborated uh with my colleague joel rosenthal who's an electrochemist and marissa kozlowski at university of pennsylvania mm -hmm. to look into this question and the reason we collaborated with joel was that we wanted to not um, so, so in deaminative cross couplings, um, nickel catalysis is not the only way to do it. You can also use photoredox catalysts, um, which have been published by you know Agarwal and Glorious and others. Um, and you can do you know electron donor acceptor pairs um, to get the single electron transfer to go. And so we wanted to really zero in on the single electron transfer and then the CN bond cleavage mm. without focusing on a nickel capture step after that. And so we use electrochemistry to look at uh, essentially the relative rates of the CN bond fragmentation. And then Marissa's group uh, worked on doing computational studies um, to, uh, to understand and, and what was going on, right? So we had kind of these experimental electrochemistry results that we could overlay on what Marissa was doing um, looking computationally. And so, um, and then we had some crystal structures too. And so if you look at the, the pyridinium, I apologize. I probably should have brought a real model, but I... <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so if you think about a pyridinium, if the pyridinium is my hand, and then um, my, my thumb and pinky are my phenyl groups, and then the carbon bond I want to break is here. So nitrogen, carbon. Um, so in the pyridinium, the phenyl groups at the two six positions actually can't out there they're not 90 degrees, but they're somewhere, but you know, they're not 45 because there's too much steric hindrance between the alkyl groups and the phenyl mm. groups. Um, and this also shifts the, the alkyl group down a little bit. Let's do that a little bit in the pyridinium. But once you do the single electron transfer into that and make the dihydropyridyl, um, it actually, uh, the CN bond actually starts to rehybridize towards the transition state of CN bond cleavage. Mm. And so we think that that's essentially due to stair hindrance between the phenyl groups and this alkyl group. Um, and so um, essentially these phenyl groups push the pyridinium towards the transition state for CN bond cleavage. Ooh, okay. And if you don't have them, then essentially the CN bond cleavage isn't as good. Now, interestingly, Kotritsky proposed that those two six phenyl groups 
were important because they elongated the CN bond. So he's probably not exactly correct about that, right? It's probably more about distorting uh, and hi the hybridization of the nitrogen. Um, but it's the right idea, right? That the phenyl groups put you closer to breaking the CN bond than without. So those are the phenyl groups of the two and the six position. The one at the four position of the pyridinium ring is um, conjugated. Mm -hmm. It's coplanar with the pyridinium. Uh, and it tends to have the largest effect on the reduction potential uh, of the pyridinium. As you, as you would expect, right? The conjugated ring should be the one that matters the most. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, so unfortunately, uh, our studies show that they're totally necessary. Um, but, um, you know, we're also stubborn. And so we've kept kind of pushing and chipping away at this. So, so we are still working on kind of how do you move away from, um, the two, six diphenyl mm. and, and we've made progress. On that. Yeah. Well, so, I'm excited to yeah. see where. Just, I just can't tell you it yet. <laughs> hey, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> no, no, no hard feelings there. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what comes next. Um, this is really, really cool chemistry you got working on there. Um, Thanks. But Professor Thanks. Watson, we've had fun. Yeah, Professor Watson, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. I had a very fun conversation today and uh, talk some chemistry. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what comes next. I'm ready to do it. Ready to see. Thanks. Thanks so much. It has been really fun to talk with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, folks. I think it was, I don't know, it was episode something. I don't even really know. But, um, I'll see you guys next time.